So that song was actually sung in South Africa during apartheid to encourage political prisoners and remind them that they were not alone in their struggle for justice. And we learned it at our Unitarian Universalist Pacific Western Regional Conference in Portland at the end of April, which I attended with Arnie and David Barker. Now the Western region comprises about a third of the country geographically, basically from the Rockies West, including Hawaii and Alaska. And every three or four years or so, we gather as a region. Two months later, together with Todd and Lorella Hess, I attended Unitarian Universalism's largest annual international conference, our General Assembly, which was held this year in Kansas City. And the goal of these conferences is to come together with Unitarian Universalists from all over, to learn and to grow, to get to know other Unitarian Universalists, to decide on the governance of the overall association, and to understand the pulse of what's going on in Unitarian Universalism throughout this country and abroad. And shortly, the Barkers and the Hesses are going to share their impressions. But first, I wanted to spend a few minutes lifting up some important takeaways about the state of our faith, which were elucidated at these two conferences. So if you're new here today, this service is really focused on the, the core of Unitarian Universalism and what we're all about. As many of you know, last year we began in earnest a process of dismantling white supremacy in our denomination. Now, for those of you who haven't been a part of the many conversations that we've had over this past year, we're talking about white supremacy culture, which for the past 400 years has infused everything we do in this country our institutions, our educational system, our policing, our military, our government, and our laws. And in becoming more conscious about how that's also impacted the structures in our own beloved denomination, the Unitarian Universalist Association has been working diligently to examine its hiring practices, to audit its power structures, and find ways to make our faith and leadership more diverse, inclusive and welcoming. And this work was beautifully reflected both at regional assembly and at general assembly through new styles of leadership in our association's business meetings, which were different from just Robert's rules of order in a new way, and in the way worship and music was led as well as in workshops and congregational study actions. In fact, at general assembly, delegates picked undoing intersectional white supremacy as the primary multi-year congregational study action issue, suggesting that every congregation around the country focus on this work with materials and support from the UUA uh, along the way. So the term intersectional white supremacy may be foreign to some of you, but it asks us to look at how race, how culture, class, income, gender, age, ability, and other identities interact and affect our country and our institutions. At the end of General Assembly, delegates also voted on what social action focus to take on immediately as an association. And out of six possible actions, all important actions of immediate witness, the one that was adopted was to end family separation and detention of asylum seekers and abolish ICE. Now, this included an immediate recommended day of action in San Diego with Mi Gente on July 2nd that I know some of you here attended. We also voted to change the second source, the wording of our second source, which you'll see on the backs of your order of service, from the words and deeds of prophetic women and men to the words and deeds of prophetic people. So in future, you'll see that there. And if you'd like to see everything we discussed and voted on, you can go to uua.org and review General Assembly business, but there's too much to cover it all in a brief moment here. But my main goal at ministry days, which came right before General Assembly, and then General Assembly and Regional Assembly, was to attend as many workshops as I could, talks, collegial gatherings, and so on, that would help me learn 
transform and enrich my ministry and have many things to bring back to you as a congregation. Some of the most challenging takeaways came from Brittany Packnett's powerful WHERE lecture, which you can view online and I highly recommend you do. Brittany is an educator, an organizer, a writer and a speaker at the intersection of culture and justice. And following in the steps of Martin Luther King Jr. and Brian Stevenson, who'd given the WHERE lecture in previous years, Packnett gave a humble and compelling talk calling us all, calling all of us to do more about racial justice in this land. And she said, the more you benefit from white supremacy, the more responsible you have to be to dismantle it. She challenged us. And I urge you to watch her remarkable talk online. I was also deeply impacted by workshops on totalitarianism and fascism as well as on various international expressions of Unitarianism around the world, a faith that seems to take different forms depending on whether you're practicing it in the Philippines, in India, in Hungary, or in the US. But the workshop I found most inspiring was focused on growing congregations in the 21st century. Led by leaders from our UU megachurch, um, it's over a thousand members, so we do call it a mega church, all souls in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They suggested that we focus on three elements for our congregations to be spiritually vital and relevant in the future. And these three qualities are connection, compassion, and courage. It was thrilling to meet and get to know the real life Reverend Carlton Pearson, who's featured in the new Netflix movie come Sunday. If you haven't watched it, I highly recommend it. Believing that a loving God would not damn people to hell, Pearson left his Pentecostalist megachurch, and that really was a megachurch of like 10,000 people, and became a universalist. And he now shares in the ministry at All Souls with other UU ministers. And the motto for their congregation and for their interpretation of Unitarian Universalism is love beyond belief, love beyond belief. An all-encompassing love is the indisputable universalist message and not what we may or may not believe. We all have very different takes on that in this room, but I think we can agree that love is the most important message we share. Our new UUA board president, uh, UUA, UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, whom you see on the front of your order of service, took this a step further. She called on us to emphasize curiosity over judgment and care over critique. Let me say that again. Curiosity over judgment and care over critique. That's a whole sermon right there for another time. And she reminded us that perfectionism and doing things right shouldn't be our focus, but rather encouraged us to find ways we're each uniquely called to express our faith in the world. She entreated us to step wholeheartedly into what Unitarian Universalism calls us to do. And like the song we sang earlier, remember we are not alone walking through these challenging times. As a faith, we're showing up again and again together to stand for humanity with courageous love. These are tough times for our country and the world, but we have to keep believing that love is stronger than hate. We have to keep siding with love and advocating for goodness, for integrity, and for truth wherever and whenever possible. And we have to keep focusing on what we can do right now, united in love, together in action, so that we can all continue to hope. May it be so. And here are others' experiences of these amazing events. David? Good morning. I'm David Barker. 
And on Friday, April 27th through Sunday, April 30th, Ani and I attended the Pacific Western Regional Assembly that was held in Portland, Oregon. And as you just heard Reverend Nika say, in addition to being the annual business meetings for the four large Western districts of the UUA and Camp de Beneville Pines, it's also an enriching gathering of UUs in spiritual community, workshops, music, and worship. Regional assembly occurs about once every three years with individual district meetings being held in the intervening years. In a way, it's like a mini general assembly with just 13 states of the Pacific Western region, about 20% of the adult members of the UUA. Having attended many general, regional, and district assemblies in the past, I approached this gathering with excitement and anticipation, expecting to be recharged and motivated. I was not disappointed. After some music, a celebratory introduction and welcome by Reverend Dr. James Kubel Komodo, and more music, I was inspired by our UUA president, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, and her message that this is no time for a casual faith or a casual commitment to your values or your communities. That we are living in what Dr. King called the fierce urgency of now. I am always motivated and provoked to explore my spiritual work by such expressive descriptions of my faith. She said that our work of fighting oppression and injustice, we are not alone. We have the support of our fellow congregates, of all the congregations of the UUA, and other organizations that want to affect change and spread the kind of powerful, unconditioning, overflowing love that Dr. King called agape. She also reminded me that it's not about being fully prepared to do this work. It's about showing up with the best we have to offer. On Saturday morning, in a process similar to our chalice circles, I was again enriched by the opportunity to participate in a caucus on white privilege, a group of about eight people who shared how white privilege has benefited them in their lives and about how white privilege has hindered them in understanding white supremacy. These kinds of deep sharings have always left me feeling more connected to my fellow UUs. Everyone is included in the circle of love and that circle never goes wider from the center. It goes wider from people at the edge, at the margins, who understand the limits of oppression and are fighting to break the barriers. We always have to have one foot planted near the center in the status quo. It's part of our history. However, the other must be at the edge, firmly planted in the movement for justice. This regional assembly has helped me move one foot in the movement to justice. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Ani Barker, <clears throat> excuse me. I walked away from this regional assembly filled with music and spirit and connection. From Friday night's keynote speaker to Sunday morning service, the rooms were filled with over 600 people singing, chanting, and breathing together. It stirred my soul, especially since a few songs were introduced, and usually new songs, so that their singing with this huge, large group infused me with this deep sense of knowing the song. And then when I come back here, like today, singing Courage, it re I relive the event, uh, re-loving the song and reinventing myself as I know it deeper and louder. And of course, the sermons were fabulous, too but then we have Reverend Nika. So although it doesn't get much better, <laughs> it does get different and, and, and yet comfortingly familiar. Um, hearing our values from different voices in a different style reminds me that Unitarian Universalism is alive and well all over the land. I also, we also heard from Congresswoman Pramila Japal, She's the first Indian woman in Congress. She spoke with power and conviction. She was amazing. So she said, and I know there's a proverb similar to this, tell me the facts and I will learn. Tell me the truth, I will believe. Tell me a story 
and I will remember forever. She talked about the power of stories, about telling our stories um, to each other. She said that telling our stories can be liberating and providing a deep, provides a deep connection. We all want and need to be seen and loved, and those stories share and connect us. Our life stories of strength and courage and resilience, they bind us together. We are more alike than we are different. And this can be the bridge between cultures and peoples. She said we need to keep speaking up, speaking out, telling our stories of love and connections between all peoples. And so she calls us to call people in. She says, call people in as much as you call people out in, as far as racism goes. She says that um, whites are deeply needed as translators, as bridges, so that people of, um, I don't feel, feel seem so angry um, and they don't have to do it by themselves. She talked about assuming good intentions and sometimes our words land and we have to listen to our words and the impact that they have. Sometimes our words land and they hurt, not intentionally, but there's time to correct our words. So we have to listen as we speak and correct right there on the spot. <coughs> Reverend Kate McCraw from Oregon City joined a conversation that I attended with her wise, wise words. She said, when times get tough, turn to wonder. Instead of being furious, get curious. And I experienced this last week while talking with some family members in the Midwest. Um, but I started asking questions with curiosity, offering them some new views on some of their stereotypes and judgments and hurtful views. And I, I listened to their, their story. Um, and I, I think they were open to my thoughts and I felt like I was heard. So I do feel blessed that we have had these opportunities to go to conferences and hope that we have more because I do get touched by what I see around our state, around our country. It's a lot of similar work with similar passions. We are changing the world through justice and compassion, through our music and our ministry, and it's great to hear it from all around you use. Thank you. I'm Todd Hess. I went to General Assembly as a delegate for the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. UUSC is a human rights organization guided by Unitarian Universalist principles and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We are an associate member of the UUA. UUSC hosts several workshops and a gala celebration. Our GA speaker this year was Luong Ong, if you haven't heard of her before, you are not alone. Attendance at the gala was lighter than some years, in part because GA had a smaller crowd and because Luong isn't well known outside of certain circles. Attendance swells when we've had big names. John Lewis, Martin Luther King III, Anita Hill. There's a fun but kind of sad fascination with celebrity. When our son Philip was young, he thought of fame as transitive. When I made room for Jeffrey Rush to put his jacket in front of my stuff going through an airport x-ray machine, Philip declared me famous. <laughs> Back to Luong Ong. She was a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997 for her work to ban landmines. She spoke at the gala after receiving UUSC's Eleanor Roosevelt Human Rights Leadership Award. Luong recounted some of her story as a survivor of the Cambodian genocide as a child. Imagine the setting for those in the audience. It was relatively early days in our understanding that the US government was taking children from their parents with no plans to reunite, reunite them. With that fresh wound in our hearts, Luong told us about the Khmer Rouge 
killing her father. Her mother sent the children away so that they wouldn't all be killed. In fact, her mother and other family members were killed. Luong became a refugee and eventually made it to Vermont. Her story moved on to how she found strength and a way to move through the anger to make meaning in her life. We were stunned. And I was sad for this story and that more people hadn't received the blessing of Luong telling it. Fascination with fame can lead us to believe it's the famous people who make the biggest changes in life. But usually, these, those people weren't famous first. GA reminded me that we should not look only to big names to lead us. We work for change because it is deeply needed. And from all of us, some of whom Some of who become leaders just doing the work, those not yet famous, and those who won Nobel Prizes but are known for their work, not their name. I'm Lorella Hess. And I went to General Assembly this year as a CVUUF delegate. We were significantly underrepresented. It was just me and Nika. <coughs> Attendance overall was pretty low, at around 2,700, probably due to the competing draw of regional assemblies and the GA location in Kansas City. Because of that light turnout, GA lost its usual position as the world's second largest gathering of Unitarians. This year that honor goes to the annual meeting of the Unitarian Union of Northeast <coughs> India, which drew more than 3,000. A leader from UUNEI spoke at one of my favorite GA workshops, inspired by the 450th anniversary of the Edict of Torda. Unitarians all over the world are honoring that foundational document of our faith, which was the first official call for religious tolerance in Christian history, and which established our key principles of the free pulpit and the selection of ministers by congregations rather than bishops. Another outstanding workshop was the Intersections of Justice. That's where I was introduced to the book Justice on Earth, which is going to be the UUA's next common read. Intersectional justice work is informed by the understanding that white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism are deeply connected and powerfully reinforcing. The opposite is called silo work where activists ignore relationship building and cross-cultural impact. Here are a couple of great takeaways from that workshop. We're all in this together, and we're all in it differently. And our silo justice work <coughs> benefits only the system. The theme of G this GA was all are called. General Assembly always has a theme, but it doesn't always resonate so powerfully with UU history and my own life and the immediate political context. This time, we even got a terrific theme song. All Are Called harkens back to James Luther Adams's principle of the prophethood of all believers, the idea that each of us has an obligation to push social change in the right direction. I'm trying to step up personally more than ever, and so many of us are doing the same. 
The weekend after GA, it was wonderful to see dozens of CVUUF people and hundreds of our neighbors turning out to protest cruel immigration policies. <clears throat> All are called. All. Thank you all. I, I know that I feel enriched hearing all of their stories about how they experience General Assembly and Regional Assembly and feel free to connect with them individually to further. So next year, General Assembly will take place in Spokane. I'm pronouncing it right this time. Spokane, Washington, <laughs> from June 19th to 23rd. And we're going to have a smaller Pacific Southwest District Assembly in Long Beach at the end of April, which is very accessible for all of us here. So do join us. General Assembly is going to be taking a different form next year by focusing on our theology, who we want to be spiritually and where we want to go as a faith. So this focus on theology over business is a big shift from current General Assemblies, but it harkens back to universalist conferences of old in which business and theologically based gatherings were alternated every year. So we're going back to that idea and it should be really exciting to be part of that. I'm hoping we can have a large showing from CBUF at GA next year, as it'll be the last one on the West Coast for several years. Join us. All are called. All are called to advance this movement of love, spirit, and justice. 